They see him here. They see him here. And they see him here. We know it because he said it. Jesus said, the world will see him when the world sees us. That's why together we do this. We give so that those who've not yet seen can see. It means something when the world sees how we give. It means something because we do not look the same. It means something because we do not sound the same. It means something because when we give, this is what the world sees. They see the gospel doing what the world cannot. They see the gospel making us one. And so we give. We give so that missionaries can go. We give so that churches can be started, hurts can be healed, and truth can be shared. We give so the world might see Jesus in us. United, United as one. Well, it is that time of the year where we began to collect uh, that Annie Armstrong Easter offering to support uh, North American mission work. Uh, and so as you're able to give, prayerfully consider what sacrifice that you uh, can make. Our campus-wide goal, $750. And I know that we always rise to that level of expectation. And so thank you in advance for your willingness to give. Um, with that, with this uh, season of missions, offering today is a missions chapel. And uh, one of our sister agencies and institutions in the Kentucky Baptist Convention, uh, they are represented here today with Brother Rusty Ellison, who has came uh, our way to share in chapel today. And so we're grateful for him. Him, being willing to make that trip. He is the founder of Crossings Ministry, and he was giving this, that testimony uh, before chapel started today, and just a joy uh, to share that kindred spirit with him and the excitement he has for the Lord and seeing lost uh, students come to faith in Christ and those who are saved to be discipled. And so we're looking forward to what he is going to share with us and just uh, celebrate the fact that we are sister institutions in Christ in the Kentucky Baptist uh, Convention. Well, we want to pray together, and then we're going to worship the Lord, and we'll turn him loose and let him share with us here today. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and Lord, we praise your high and holy name. We're grateful and thankful for you and for every way you have provided for us. We do pray, Father, that you'd pour out your spirit upon this campus and upon the campuses of Crossings Ministries. Father, as we know that uh, not only do they exist on two properties, but Lord, day camps uh, around Kentucky, we pray that even now you would prepare the hearts of of those students, Lord, who you are going to save uh, through their ministry this year. We pray that you would just uh, transform hearts and lives through the power of your gospel, through the preaching, the teaching of your word. And Lord, raise up from this place, Lord, a generation of servants who would go, Lord, into the mission field, the marketplace, into churches, Lord, all around the world and proclaim your truth. Father, help us to be your hands, your feet, your mouthpiece, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Clear Creek. I like that. How about we all stand as we worship Jesus? Today we're going to be singing about the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that's my favorite thing to sing about. Amen. There is one gospel on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my Father's plan. The Son has rescued me. Oh, what a gospel, oh, what a peace. My highest joy and my deepest need. Now and forever, He is my light. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one gospel to which I cling, all else I count as loss. For there where justice and mercy meet, he saved us on that cross. No more I boast in what I can bring, no more I carry the weight of sin. For he has brought me from death to life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is 
where gospel, where hope is found. The empty tomb still speaks, for death could not keep my Savior down. He lives and I am free. Now, my Savior, I fix my eyes. My life is his and his hope is mine. For he has promised I too will rise. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this gospel the church is one. We do not walk alone. We have his spirit as we press on to lead us safely home. own story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when in glory still I will sing of the story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this uh, next song is actually the story of the gospel. It's definitely my favorite song, and it's the King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. you rose all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tomb and the angel stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of Christ was born. Then the Spirit lit the flame. 
Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. And by his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Praise forever to the King of Kings. Now this is the time that we're going to come to the Lord in prayer. Um, we're going to do this in silence. And uh, you're more than welcome to come to this altar and uh, just talk to the Father and give him praise for the gospel that he sent his son to die for us on the cross. Please take this time. Father, we love to come to you in this silence to where nothing's around us, no thing can distract us from you, to where we can come in your, come in your house today and just get to learn more about you and your son Jesus. And Lord, uh, as we praise you in this last song, Lord, help us remember that you, you sent your son for us, your only son, to die on the cross for us and raise him again three days later. And now he's with you in heaven. Lord, help us remember that, all the pain he went through, how he was so perfect. And Lord, let us give praise to him. In your name I pray, amen. See him there. The great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head, the Father's heart displayed for us. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Lifted up on Calvary's hill, we curse your name, and even still, you bore our shame and paid the cost. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Yes, we do. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise in this hallelujah to your own. Up. 
His sacrifice for every sin, our Savior died. The Lord of life can't be contained. Our God has risen from the grave. Our God has risen from the grave. Oh, behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise in this hallelujahs to your only name. Jesus, you will death is done we'll see your face bright as the sun what a day we'll bow before the king of kings oh god forever we will sing let's sing to him Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, uh, thank you for this time that you've allowed us to come here and worship you, Lord. It's been such a good time uh, just to grow closer with uh, the fellow Clear Creekers. And uh, Lord, I I pray for the missionary that's about to speak. Lord, I pray that you um, you let him be. He is the mouthpiece for you. (laughs) And Lord, uh, I pray that you speak the words through him that you want us to hear. And Lord, help us listen. Lord, help us put our anxieties and our worries about what's going to happen later today and focus in this time and just grow closer to you, Lord. I pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, DJ. Thank you very much. And I'm with you. King of Kings is one of my favorites. And we sing it every summer at Crossings. Uh, Good morning, Clear Creekers. Without looking at the banners behind me, don't don't look. If you look, you're you're peeking, you're cheating. Each one of those, every one of those, opens with the same phrase. Have you ever noticed it? And do you know what it is? We are a community. We are a community. We are a community. We are a community. You all are a community. And gosh, I am so thankful to be here today as I represent Crossings. I'm thankful that God has arranged the circumstances in which I can come when there is an air of excitement and anticipation uh, on your campus. I'm thankful for the opportunity. Uh, I I thought driving down today, my last time to preach in this chapel was before some of you all were born. Hayden down here is only 19. My last time, Dr. I was telling Dr. Goodman, Dr. Bill Whitaker was the president down here. And I had known Dr. Whitaker because I spent every summer in Murray, Kentucky, growing up as a child. And it was through the ministry of H.C. Childs, Dr. Childs, that was so much a part of this institution for years that uh, uh, God began to grow me up and eventually get his hands on me and lead me into the ministry. But I am very, very grateful. Uh, I pastored for many years, for 25 of the last 30 years. Uh, there were five years in which I was extraordinarily blessed to be a part of the team that launched Crossings. Brief story, I was telling Josh and Dr. Goodman in 1996, 
Kentucky Baptist had determined they were going to get rid of one of our two camps. We have Cedarmore outside of Shelbyville, uh, 45 minutes from Louisville, and then we way down in western Kentucky, about as far as you can go from here, we have Jonathan Creek. And uh, Kentucky Baptists were going to sell Cedarmore. And they had to vote on it. Since it involved the disposition of property, there had to be a vote at the annual meeting. So when the moderator called for the vote, he said, all in favor of selling Cedarmore, stand. So I quickly stood. I was for getting rid of it. I'd only been here twice. And one of the days was in February. It was cold. It was wet. It was damp. And honest to goodness, uh, I woke up in the morning, ladybugs were crawling on me. And I don't know whether you've have, ever had ladybugs crawl on you before, but they leave tracks. And if you're sleeping in anything that's light colored, you can tell everywhere they've been. I voted to sell it. Man sitting next to me, the, when the moderator called for the question, he said, all in favor of keeping Cedarmore, sell it. Overwhelmingly, Kentucky Baptists voted to keep Cedarmore. Uh, a year later, they deeded the properties Cedarmore and Jonathan Creek to a new entity, Kentucky Baptist Assemblies, which is now Crossings Ministries. I got a call one day from uh, one of the board members who happened to be sitting next to me at Darren Owensboro. He said, pack your bags, youngin. I said, well, tell me where I'm going. He said, God's told me you're going to be the president of the camps. I started laughing. I said, man, I voted to sell them. I'm not, there's no way I'm going to do that. Yeah, no way. So the conversation ended and I thought it was done. He called back two weeks later. He said, what do you think? I said, about what? He said, what do you think about the camps? I said, I've not thought anything about the camps. I'm not going to do it. There's no way. He said, it don't matter how you voted. God's told me this is going to happen. Would you pray for one week, just one week, and see if God begins to move your heart? So I thought I'd better drive out there and see what I'm praying over. So I drove out to Cedarmore and drove I had an old S10 blazer and drove through the woods out and drove into a big grass field, 25 or 30 acres and turned off, off my motor and the prayer, my prayer went something like this. God, you know, I don't want to do this. You know how I voted. I voted to sell them. I don't see any way this is going to work, but I'm here to see if there's any way under heaven, this is your will. So I need your direction and one more caveat. I need it in a hurry because I'm headed back to town. 30 minutes time. God had my heart. As clearly as I'm looking at you all, I knew what he wanted me to, good, to do. I thought he must be up there laughing, saying, you voted to sell it, and now I want you to come lead it. So we started crossings in 2000, three years later. God gave us a crystal clear, compelling vision for what could be. We saw a camp that unchurched kids would look at and say, I may not know Jesus, but that looks like a ball. I'll go. We started that first year with 1,300 students. Year two, we had 2,000. Year three, we had 3,000. And we knew we were off and running and that it was of God. And as I stand here, when I left the office yesterday for summer of 2023, we have more than 25,000 children and students that will experience crossings. So the blessings God has brought us are just beyond, beyond comprehension. My life verse is found in Ephesians chapter three. Now to he, him who is able to do immeasurably more, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. And I have been extraordinarily blessed to be part of what, how God reveals his capacity that we read about in his word to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 42. I just want to read two verses this morning. The title of my sermon is Gatorade, which is why I place a bottle of Gatorade on this pulpit. Gatorade or God? Gatorade or God? And we read the first two verses together today. And if you will, in honor of the reading of God's word, if you are able to stand as we read these two verses. As a deer pants for flowing streams, 
so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And we'll read on before I stop, although I'm going to focus on the first two. My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Have a seat, if you will. The great C.S. Lewis wrote this. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offering at sea. We are far too easily pleased. I want to present to you a question this morning that I hope is very personal for every one of you. As we read this text, a text with which many of us are familiar, do you come into this place this morning thirsting for God, wanting to know him more? Or do you come into this place this morning? Because this is what we do at 11 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. What's your motive? Do you come with a sense of expectation or do you come with a thirst for God? You all may or may not be aware, but there is a movement of God spreading across campuses like yours all across our state, but even beyond the borders of our state. In tiny Wilmore, it's as small. I, I don't know how Wilmore's population compares to uh, uh, Pineville. Yeah, thank you all. I just drove through there. Uh, but, but it's small and 50,000 people descended on tiny uh, Wilmore over the last couple of weeks. God is at work in the hearts and lives of students like you all. One of my friends, Dr. Donald Whitney, he is a longtime professor at Southern Seminary. He wrote a great little book if you all have never seen it, but one of, one of the books, many books that he's written, 10 Questions to diagnose your spiritual health. It's a little book. I go into churches that don't have pastors and spend six months to 18 months now. We call it transitional leadership. I just finished up where Dr. Whitaker uh, came from at, at First Murray. But uh, I use this book everywhere I go. Whitney asked a key question. How is it that a true believer in Christ can become a dry and thirsty soul. When Jesus promises in John chapter four, whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Today, the psalmist tells us as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you. My soul thirsts for God. So we seek to answer the question, our brief time together. Do you come here today with a thirst for God. When I was much, much younger, a little boy, my daddy was a football and basketball coach in Louisville, Louisville Mail and Manual. Anybody here from Louisville? Delisha? Yeah, okay. I want to make sure I got the name right. He, he, he was football and basketball coach. I remember spending so many hours in the gym with my father. It was an idyllic childhood. All of us cannot say that, but I went everywhere with my daddy. And I was a fixture in the locker room. I was also a fixture on the football fields. But I can remember when I was a boy, eight or nine, ten years old, uh, when, when late summer came and the football team returned and they would go through two-a-days. They would practice in the morning, practice in the evening. And do you all know that the, that the, the tendency of coaches in those days was to withhold liquid 
from you in order to get, inflict more pain on you. And not only would they withhold liquid, but they would give you salt tablets that were just, gosh, awful. They were horrible. And, and instead of giving you water, they would give you salt tablets. They didn't know anybody. They didn't know that they were putting athletes at risk. Then in the late 1960s and early 70s, science began to teach something different. That athletes that were properly hydrated, football, basketball players particularly, could perform at a much higher level if they had plenty to drink. In 1985, there was a coach at the University of Florida, coached the Gators. His name was Ray Graves. And he wanted a drink that would help his players, football players, at the University of Florida. In the brutal Florida heat, he wanted a drink that might replenish their needs in a short amount of time. And a team of scientists went to work at Greg Graves, Coach Graves' instruction. And do you know what they invented? Gatorade. Gatorade, the real thirst quencher as they advertised for years. Scientists determined that the electrolytes could be replenished faster from drinking Gatorade than even drinking water. We know that when one becomes dehydrated, one's bodily functions cease to function properly. For years, when I was at Walnut Street Church in downtown Louisville as pastor, every year we would go to the Amazon. It was our mission's emphasis, and we would go there, and we would take a group of, of church members and doctors and dentists, and we would go for two weeks, and we would, uh, we would navigate the high water in the Amazon and, and take the gospel and medical care and dental care to villages that had no capacity, no medical care. And oh, what a blessing it was. But with the young people that we took to function down there near the equator in Brazil along the Amazon, we had to just stand on them practically to get them to stay hydrated. Because what we know about dehydration is that once you have an unquen, it takes a lot longer to get rehydrated than it does dehydrated. Makes me thirsty to talk about it, but I'm not going to drink right now. 22 years ago, I was a student at seminary, and five of us were blessed to go to the Middle East and the Holy Land on a trip with three other seminaries. We were gone for three and a half weeks. Trip to the Holy Land, and uh, have any of you seen, you remember Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Harrison Ford? Remember the scene with Petra? the old ancient city. We visited Jordan and uh, went, to, went to Petra. And, and to get there to the treasury, which is what you see in the Indiana Jones movie, you go back a, a slot canyon for a mile, mile and a half, and you, you come to the end of that canyon, and then right before your very eyes is this unbelievable work of architecture right there in front of you. Everybody in our group rode in on horses, everybody but me, because I have severe horse allergies. I am allergic to the dander, so I had to walk. We walked in 7 o'clock in the morning in the cool of the morning. We spent five hours back there, and we started out right at noon, and the sun was right overhead. And I couldn't get on a horse, so I had to walk, and it was about a mile and a half. And as I got about three quarters of a mile out of the slot canyon, I was pouring sweat and I was becoming dehydrated and I was losing control of my bodily functions. So I sat down thinking somebody will stop and ask if I need some help. You know what happened? Nobody stopped. They just kept riding on by. Our group was way in front of me because they had ridden out in front of me finally got out of the canyon. And I, I'll never forget, I've never been as thirsty in my life before or since. 
I drank and I drank and I drank. I made it to my lodge room and I sat in the floor of the shower for an hour, just soaking up the liquids. It was one of the most miserable, unforgettable experiences of my life. Question that I began with this morning. Have you ever been that thirsty? When were you last thirsty at all? Out west, they have all kinds of water problems on the Colorado River. Living in Louisville, we don't know what water problems are. We have abundant water. And an even more relevant question for you all as we gather here this morning, as we deal with thirst for God, do you thirst for him? Water's been in the news even lately up north of here in Ohio at East Palestine with the, where the train was derailed. The water supply has become contaminated. We don't know what it's like to live in a desert. Without water, brothers and sisters, life does not exist. Plants, animals, and people all depend on water. This passage this morning reminds us so clearly of thirst. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The next psalm as well, Psalm 43, also expresses the strong desire for the psalmist return, to return to God's presence. For in those days, the place where they experienced God was the sanctuary. They had been taught and schooled to attend worship when one was hungering and thirsting and looking for God's presence. I'll be 74 here in a couple months. I'm still blessed with a lot of energy and drive and passion, and I'm thankful for that. Years ago, again, sometime in the 1990s, there was a, a Lifeway Bible study written called The Mind of Christ. Some of you older ones, I see Dr. Goodman and Josh nodding on it. Mind of Christ, T. W. it was written by T.W. Hunt. T.W. Hunt was one of the great, great prayer warriors of his generation. And he tells the story one day, there was an old song we used to sing in the 1990s, Lord, I want to know you. And in chapel one day at Southwestern Seminary, they were singing, Lord, I want to know you. And T.W. was just broken before God. And he asked himself the question, Lord, I'm singing this, but do I really want to know you? And he came to the conclusion, the answer was unquestionably, yes, I want to know you more. Oh, brothers and sisters, may that be the song that every one of us sing. In all likelihood, everyone in here today already knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Already knows God. But do you want to know him more? I'm not talking about just merely getting a degree. I'm talking about having an up-close, intimate, personal encounter and relationship with God. Where wanting to know Him more and developing that thirst is one of the driving forces in your life. Paul wrote, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Some of y'all going to get there before me. Paul was following his encounter on the Damascus Road. He certainly undeniably came to know God. Paul became the greatest missionary in the history of the world. Read what he says beginning in verse 7 of chapter 3. 
But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends upon faith. Look at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, possible I may attain resurrection from the dead. This passage calls to mind the question, Maybe you read this and say, well, wait, wait wait a minute. Didn't Paul already know Jesus? We know the answer to that. Sure, he did. But even with all of his experience, as powerful as it was that day on the Damascus Road, after he had persecuted the followers of the way he has the encounter, certainly he knew Christ. But these few verses show us Paul's unending desire to know him more. A.W. Tozier wrote, to have found God, and I pray that all of us have found God, been found by God. To have found, to have found God and still pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. Thus the psalmist writes, so my soul pants for you. So we gather here this morning. Do you thirst for God? Do you long to know God more? Does your very soul pant for God? Some of us can relate to this passage very clearly even right now because there are those in this room in a gathering of this size who come into this place panting for God. Dr. Whitney says this is a sign. Your thirst, brothers and sisters, hear me clearly. Your thirst is a sign of soul growth. For Dr. Whitney says it is God himself who nurtures this desire in all of us. Multiple kinds of spiritual thirst soul thirst. Dr. Whitney says the first is the thirst of the empty soul. Every one of us, believers, unbelievers, we want, we long, we thirst for something we do not have. The unbeliever longs for anything as a substitute for God to fill a deep void inside. The unbeliever's soul is empty, empty because he or she does not yet know God. And because he or she does not yet know God, he or she does not seek to fill it with God. We look to all kinds of material goods and money and work and love and sex when we don't know Jesus. We're bombarded from the moment we awaken in the morning and look at our cell phones now or turn on the radio or turn on the TV. We're bombarded with thousands of messages and, and ads that scream at us. Here's where you find the answer. You need this. This is the thirst of the empty soul. On the other hand, there is the thirst of the dry soul. This is a soul that is thirsty and can be experienced only, only in the soul of the believer. The longing is what occurs over time when we want and we long for and we drink too much of what the world has to offer and seek too little of what God has to offer us. And which, 
and, and when such happens in the life of the believer, we find ourselves as if we're living in a dry and barren land where there is no water. If you've never been there, one day you're likely to pass through such an area. I've been there. Been there more times than I am proud to admit. When I felt so distant from God, when there was a disconnect, when I had allowed whatever it was to dominate my life in such a way that most of my time was not spent wanting to know God more. When we find ourselves in that state, our souls become parched. And that's what happens over time when our spiritual disciplines, when Bible reading and prayer and worship, on and on and on, when those aren't neglected. And over time, ever so slowly in general terms, over time, our souls begin to run dry. Here's a biblical truth. There are times and seasons in our life when God's presence seems so very real to us. That's what students are experiencing all over the nation right now. But there are also times when we feel so strongly that God is far away or even absent. Dr. Whitney calls those God's desertions. You don't have to stand. You don't have to raise your hand. Have you ever felt God's desertions? We know the promise of God that he will never leave us or forsake us once we come to him. But the truth is there are moments in our lives when we feel like maybe he has. Maybe he has forgotten us. There are seasons of our lives that God allows to come to you and to me in experiences that even when we know he won't leave us, it really seems like he has. It's at such a time as that in which we tend to dwell and focus on ourselves instead of God himself. We know we need to focus on God to move our way out of it. But our weariness or frustration prevents or inhibits our capacity to look to God to satisfy our thirst. God has designed us, brothers and sisters, friends, to hunger and thirst for him. And as good as this is, God and God alone will satisfy our thirsty souls. I read a comment on this passage. It's as if Jesus is saying, when you drink my water, and this is regarding John chapter four, Jesus is there at the water, at the well. And he says, whoever drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Talking about the water from the well with the woman at the well. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And Jesus says, when you drink my water, your thirst is destroyed forever. Is not destroyed forever. Key word, excuse me. When you drink my water, your thirst is not destroyed forever. If, if it did that, would you feel any need of my water afterward? That is not my goal, Jesus says. I do not want self-sufficient saints. When you drink my water, it makes a spring within you. A spring satisfies thirst, not removing the need we have for water but by being there to give you water when you get thirsty. So drink, brothers and sisters, again and again and again. Drink. Understand this morning, maybe you've never heard it put this way, but spiritual thirst is a blessing from God. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, 
Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be blessed. When you're feeling spiritual dryness and thirst, it's because the Holy Spirit is at work within you even at that moment. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, when a man pants after God, it is a secret life within which makes him do it. He would not long after God by his nature. No man thirsts for God when he is left in his carnal, unconverted state. The unconverted man or woman pants after anything before he or she pants for God. The panting after God proves a renewed nature when you long after God. It's a work of grace in your soul, and you should be thankful for it. So it's God who creates in us a thirst for himself that he and only he can satisfy you. So my charge to you this morning as we begin to wrap up, how's your thirst this morning? I, I, I live with the thirst. I had, that's why Gatorade fit in the sermon this morning. Tozier wrote a prayer I want to read as we close. O oh God, I have tasted thy goodness. Have we all tasted his goodness? Every one of us? Yes. And it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need for further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire, O oh God. O oh God, I want to want thee. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made more thirsty still. Show me thy glory, O Lord. I pray to thee that I may so know thee indeed. Begin in me a new mercy and a new work of love. Give me the grace to follow thee up from this misty lowland where I have wandered so long. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to pray in a minute, and uh, we're okay time-wise. I want to I wanna, I wanna close this out and do something a little bit different. I want to pray. I want to invite you to come if you want to kneel at the altar, but I want you to also take your hymnal, and uh, we're, we're, we're going to sing our way out of this. Because God is at work on this campus. Uh, I am thrilled to be here today, but I am also thrilled to be here because there is such a sense of excitement and anticipation about what God is going to do. Thank you, Delicia. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going we're gonna to sing hymn number 237. DJ, forgive me, because I am not a musician, and I am not a singer. But I want you to leave here today with a sense of wonder and awe and amazement that God has you here at this moment in time. It is not by accident that God brings you here at this moment in time. But I want you to be amazed at how he works in your life. I want to pray. And then we're going to sing. And you feel free to respond as God leads you. However it may be, if you need to come and kneel here at the altar, if you're just fine where you are. But I'm going to pray that God will increase our soul thirst for him. That we will be like the deer that finds the refreshment in the living water that Christ offers to every one of us. Father, we bow our heads before you today. God, you've been so good to us. You've brought us here to this place. This place that for decades and decades and decades has equipped and educated and raised up 
young men and women, followers of Christ, to go into the field as missionaries, as ministers, proclaiming there is no other way under heaven by which men and women can be saved other than Jesus Christ. And God, for those that are here this morning that might sense that they are in that place in life, that season of life where you seem distant, maybe their soul is parched, maybe they're thirsty. God, would you show them today that the capacity to quench that thirst belongs to you and you alone, no one else. No other thing, no other person can quench that thirst. Father, it may be that many of us here today are at a good place. Maybe our, our, our thirst is well quenched at this moment. Maybe we're overflowing with joy and wonder at what you're doing in our lives, individually and corporately here at Clear Creek. God, for those of us that are a good place, our prayer would be, Lord, I want to know you more. Certainly I know Jesus, but I want to know you more. Give me while I'm here for the balance of my life, the the burning desire to know you more. And Father, as we prepare to stand and sing one of the great hymns of our faith, Lord, cultivate and create within every one of us a sense of amazement that we are part of your plan to reach the nations of the world and that you provided for us salvation to be found in Jesus Christ. God, thank you for saving us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let us never lose that amazement. Let us never realize that it's through your grace we don't deserve what you've done for us. Keep us in that attitude of amazement as we stand and sing. Let's stand, brothers and sisters. We got to sing the fourth verse. We got to go all the way through because it's against the Baptist law not to sing verse four of this, okay? And don't leave me hanging. I'm not going to be the only one here singing, okay? Sing it loud and quick. I stand amazed. Yeah. 
his face I at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior.